Nicholas, might have to say to us about the world we live in today and particularly about how we are governed. We've been thinking about is politics inherently unfair because it's always the few making decisions on behalf of the many. So throughout a variety of workshops on all of those plays, uh, we now have um, some expert witnesses that are going to talk to you about different aspects of um, both Shakespeare's work, ancient Rome, and hopefully modern politics today even. Um, what we'll be asking you to do is to come up and ask us your questions that you've been thinking about today. And we've also got some coming through on Twitter as well, which is great. So the first thing I'd like us to do is um, get to hear who our expert witnesses are. So starting with Greg, can you just tell us your name and also what your area of expertise is? <clears throat> My name's Greg Doran. I'm the Artistic Director of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Uh, I've had the luck here in Stratford of directing all four of the Shakespeare plays, uh, though I'm not actually directing any of the ones in this particular season. Um, so my uh, area of work is, is exploring the texts of Shakespeare's plays to see what they say and to see what resonance they have today. Uh, I'm Natalie Haynes and I am a classicist. Um, I write books about the ancient world and the modern world and how they um, feed into each other. Um, and most recently I've been looking at drama and um, classics and sort of now um, by writing The Children of Jocasta, which is a novel of, of the Oedipus story, but told from the perspective of the women in it, who, as you'll notice from Shakespeare, don't always get as much for say as the men. <laughs> Lisa. And I'm Lisa Peter. I work at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, just around the corner, really, from here. I'm part of the education department, so we um, talk a lot and teach a lot all of Shakespeare's plays, and particularly we have a look at whatever is on here at the theatre because we get a lot of school groups and university groups in who want to, to learn more about the plays and the context around the plays, the socio-historical context of the plays, and uh, I hope that is my expertise I'm going to bring with me today. Great. And we hope we're also going to be joined um, by Malia, who is the president of the National Union of Students, but we'll see whether she makes it through the traffic. Um, so I said at the beginning of today, and I'll say at the beginning of this discussion, our starting point is the plays. We're a theatre company and we're interested in what relevance and resonances um, the, the plays that Shakespeare wrote 400 years ago have to our lives, our world, our society and our country today. So Greg, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to ask each of the panellists to just kind of give an opening salvo, an opening statement um, about how they see um, their area of expertise in, in, in what we're exploring today. And Greg, can you talk about... Shakespeare in these Roman plays presents a very particular kind of relationship between the people, all of us, and the leaders. Can you tell us a bit about the, the sort of relationship he shows us? Yeah, I think it's quite a complex one. I think whenever you look at Shakespeare, uh, I think one of the key things is not to assume that what his characters are saying is what Shakespeare thinks. <laughs> because I think he particularly in a play like Julius Caesar, I think he's very keen to give you both sides of the story. So that I think sometimes you think Brutus, for instance, is a kind of Republican hero who is uh, doing his best to, to save the Republic. Um, and in the, and the next moment, you think he's a wishy-washy liberal who simply didn't think it through. Um, you think of Caesar as a tyrant, as a dictator who has seized power to himself. And then in the next scene, you see him as a a sort of old man in his pyjamas worrying about going to the Senate the following day. Um, in terms of Shakespeare's reaction to the mob, as perhaps opposed to the people, I think he's very sceptical about them as a mob because I think he thinks they are generally um, fickle. Um, and it's up to people like Brutus and uh, then expertly uh, Mark Antony uh, to manipulate that crowd. Um, Brutus tries to do it through rather polished rhetoric, um, and I don't think he succeeds very well. And Mark Antony does it by being an anti-rhetorician. He's the one who says, I'm no orator like Brutus, I'm just a plain bloke like you guys, and then succeeds over a, a rather long speech, which is all in verse, which might give us a clue, to persuade the, audio, the, 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 the mob um, that the assassination of Caesar was a terrible thing and they should rise up. Uh, and then I think the scene that you see 
when that, some of that, a fragment of that mob murder Sinner the poet, because they think he's Sinner the conspirator, even when they're told he's Sinner the poet, and they tear him apart, is some indication, perhaps, of what Shakespeare thinks that the mob is, is, is capable of when that emotion is raised up in them and released. Thanks, Greg. And Lisa, um, uh, I'm wondering about the time that uh, Shakespeare was writing in, and, as well as the plays themselves, and what, what do you feel the Roman plays help us explore in terms of how we want to be governed? I think what is quite interesting is um, how Shakespeare presents us with different kinds of leaders, obviously. Um, we get to see Caesar, and the question is, is he a tyrant or is he not? But we, we get this idea of a leader who is very much up on a, on a pedestal. He is a, almost a godlike figure for us, for um, the people in the play. That is one kind of leader we get to see. Then we get to see Brutus, who sort of becomes the leader of, of the conspirators. And then we get to see Mark Antony um, sort of going into the pulpit and presenting us with a different idea of leadership. We see sim similar things in Antony and Cleopatra, when once again we see Mark Antony now as Antony and Cleopatra as a different kind of leader. And we, when we go to the theatre, when we see these plays, when we study the plays, um, we are actually in the position to make up our own minds, to think about what do these people really do well in terms of leadership? Are they decisive enough? Um, do they actually know what they want? Are they able to bring the entire society with them? Or are they actually absolutely horrendous leaders? Do they fail? Are they the worst thing you can imagine um, at the top of a society? So that's one of the things Shakespeare really shows us and says, look, take a look at these people and try to make out for yourselves whether you think that these are good leaders or not. But it's also quite interesting to what Greg just said about the mob, the people in Julius Caesar, because Shakespeare actually structures the play in such a way that we get to see the crowds, that we get to see the mob's reaction to the stories. He could have written the story in a more traditional way and actually just presented us with the life and death of Julius Caesar, as the t title indicates. He didn't go for that. He actually shifted the focus a bit away from Julius Caesar and we get to see these people react to these political events. And I think that is very interesting for us because we can identify um, with the normal people, the crowd, in that respect. Thank you, Lisa. So we're going to expand our conversation across time a little bit more now and go back into ancient Rome. And Natalie, how can the ancient world help us explore that question that we're looking at today of how we want to be governed? I think it's probably the, um, the place you have to begin with everything. A, a man I used to teach for a very, very long time ago um, used to gloriously intone that the House of Western Thought has many rooms but only one basement. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of will stick with that. I mean, the Greeks tried every form of government, pretty much, negative and, and positive. Um, you know, they tried democracy in fifth century Athens. Um, it's replaced by an oligarchy, a, a pretty brutal one, a rule of the few. Um, they have kingship, they have tyranny, the Athenians pride themselves on not ever having a king after that. But, you know, by the time the Romans come along, then the very notion of a king, although Rome too began with kings, seems anathema to them. And that's why the moment where Mark Antony offers Caesar a crown is so shocking. I mean, so shocking. And the, the you know, people cheering as he, as he casts the crown aside. But the idea that, he, that Caesar might see himself as a, a king, as a dictator, is is properly horrifying to the Roman Senate. But of course, to the plebs, to the Roman people, uh, you know, one ruler is, is much like another, a king and a consul, they're not so far apart. If you're, you know, an ordinary person going about your day, um, they are not as far apart as, as they seem to be from the focus that we have um, with Shakespeare. But I think it's true that opening it out to include the, the plebs as part of the cast is a huge, it's a huge difference from ancient theater. You know, when um, you watch a Sophoclean play, then they are, hashtag liminal, um, in which they <laughs> exist in the space between the public and the private, right? So Oedipus, for example, exists in the space between, the palace of Oedipus is behind the cast, the cast are just in front of the gates, and the audience, you, you're, you're standing in for the original audience of the play and for the people of Thebes in the play. So your job is multiple, you're multitasking when you watch that production. <laughs> um, but the idea that the, the ordinary people should be part of it, it suddenly makes you think that, that we as an audience have been much more included than we otherwise would have been. So I think that um, maybe the Greeks were great theoreticians of uh, 
of politics and they are always thinking, always asking these in incredibly important questions about who we are and what it means to be governed. And of course, in a democracy like in Athens, um, it's direct democracy, so people actually vote on what will actually affect them. They stand on a hill and they put up their hands. Um, we can't imagine, I think it happens in a few cantons in Switzerland now, <laughs> but generally we now have representative democracy where we vote for somebody else because our country is too big. There are too many people mm. for people to vote. It would take too long and we'd get everything done. But even in that direct democracy, of course, it was only adult male citizens who voted. So if you're a woman, if you were foreign, if you were a child, you didn't have a say, even in the most direct democracy, the most controlled democracy that has probably ever existed. Thank you. Some opening comments there. So we're going to go to our first question, and that's going to come from Emily from Mighton School. So Emily, could you come up to the microphone, please, and ask your question? Thank you very much. Oh, hello. Hello? That's great. <laughs> you just speak. It'll catch you. Okay. <laughs> does the common people of the ancient world care about democracy or do they just want a strong leader? Natalie, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to take that one. Did the common people of the ancient world care about democracy or did they just want a strong leader? Well, I think the short answer is... Um, you're probably more right with the second half of that than with the first. I think they probably cared a lot about having a strong leader, um, not least because uh, it's an incredibly uh, bellicose time, let's say. <laughs> so you're constantly at war. You do need strong leaders. It is a risky business living somewhere where you don't have a strong leader, um, as happened to, for example, um, to the Britons. Um, we did not have a strong leader. Um, and then, you know, the Romans turned up and we became Roman Britain. Um, and, our, you know, Druids and things sort of around went, oh, no, I wouldn't do that if I, oh, too late. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't a great time to not have a strong leader. Obviously, we then have a spectacular rebellion and uh, help prompt the death of the Emperor Nero. So well done us. Um, but uh, I think probably in ancient Rome, particularly, the idea of democracy was not something that would have would have come up really because they didn't have a democracy. Right. So the idea of democracy was a Greek phenomenon to them and, and ancient history. It's, it's one of those things where you have to keep reminding yourself. I have to keep reminding myself and I think about it every day that to Romans in the first century BCE, where, where we are looking at uh, today, Julio Caesar and Mark Antony's time, um, the fifth century um, Greece, where the democratic experiments had happened, is 400 years ago. That's as far from, you know, as Shakespeare is from us, right? So it's, 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 to them, it's, it's already ancient history. And so I guess um, I would like to think that there were lots of, um, you know, Romans wandering around thinking that democracy would be super, um, but I suspect that that's not the case. What is true is that later Roman periods um, during the um, empire, they constantly hark back to the Republic. So the writers that we have who are universally upper class and male um, are always looking back and saying, oh, it was better in the days of the Republic, a time long before they had been alive. So in the first century a CE or AD, if you prefer, they're looking back to the first century BCE or the second century BCE and saying how much better it was when there was a Republic. Um, as the empire goes on, they're saying how much better it was. Even in the, and you know, to us that seems insane, right? Because it ends in such a terrible civil war. And obviously people living through it didn't feel the same way. Or they, you know, there's a very, very brief civil war, 68, 69 CE, the year of four emperors, as it's known, after the death of Nero, spoiler, um, <laughs> uh, who gloriously dies being stabbed in the neck by his own secretary with the words, qualis artifex pereo, what an artist, but still I die, um, <laughs> which is fully how I intend to die, just so you know. <laughs> so if you aim a car at me, that is what I'm going to be saying. If I'm choking out a few last words, that's them. Just say that's what I said. And make sure it's in Latin so I sound cool. I say cool, of course. I mean, please don't steal my lunch money. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, there's this very brief sort of spasm of civil war but the the wars that are happening around the time of Julius Caesar of Mark Antony are so traumatic for Rome that a sort of collective folk memory stops them from ever really going back that way again so I think the way that they lived at least suggests that they were more interested in having one person even not a good person even if it was Gaius Caligula um, even if it was Nero who did you know incredibly long recitals and you had to pretend to, to die or be going into labor to get out of the theater while he was singing um, both instances in Suetonius by the way um, then uh, you you would still rather have that than have to to deal with the risk of war. Thank you Natalie. So Harry from Ormiston Academy could you come up next please? Thank you. Great. <laughs> um, if Shakespeare work, uh, Shakespeare's work is full of bias and inaccuracies, isn't the standing withhold for his work just glorified propaganda and false history? 
Greg, I think that could be a question, question for you. <laughs> Tough crowd. Well, yeah, yeah, if, well, is it full of bias and inaccuracy? Let's take that first of all. Um, I guess he's a, he's, he's a man of his, of his age, um, so uh, perhaps he takes on some of the, the, the prejudices of those age, uh, that age, but I think maybe uh, what is interesting to me is that he is really debating some of the issues that are cur current in his world. Um, you know, as we were talking about this morning, to write a play like Titus Andronicus under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, under, you know, effectively an absolute monarch in a police state, um, is, is a really risky and dangerous thing to do. And it's interesting that Shakespeare and, you know, his, his writers, um, between the opening of the public theatres in the 1580s and uh, <clears throat> the close, well, in, in, in fact, by the time you get to King Lear, pretty much every single English monarch that has ever been since William the Conqueror, with the possible exception of William Rufus, <laughs> has been, appeared on the British stage. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the playwrights are looking elsewhere for their plots than British history. So they turn to Rome. After the Titus Andronicus experiment, uh, in the beginning of the 1600s, they start looking, so Antony Cleopatra, Coriolanus, but also the other playwrights writing about Sejanus or Catiline. Um, and it, it, that might be because it's too dangerous to talk about your own history to, the, to your, your own audience. And therefore, you can use the metaphor of ancient Rome to talk about today and to air issues of sovereignty, of, of governance that, um, um, you might not, that might be too dangerous to do otherwise. Um, I don't, I, th I think the, the, the greatness of Shakespeare um, is that he doesn't really come to conclusions. He asks you questions. Um, you know, we, and, and that, it makes you debate things. And somehow he operates like, he operates like a magnet that attracts all the iron filings of whatever is going on in the world today and somehow seems to find resonance. Uh, we started rehearsals in this very building of uh, King Lear on the very day of the Brexit vote. And we realized we were discussing a play about the catastrophic effects of breaking up a union. Um, so he, somehow, how did Shakespeare know that? Well, he didn't, clearly. But somehow his inquiring mind, his curiosity about how we are in all our strangeness and madness, um, uh, I think that makes, that makes, that's what's making the play so relevant for today. I do think with um, a play like Julius Caesar that what you have there um, is a play about the single, probably the most known fact in the pagan world. Julius Caesar, spoiler alert or not, Julius Caesar gets killed. <laughs> and the challenge of directing, you know, Good we know that. In the middle of the play, he's going to get killed. So in a way, Shakespeare's going, we're going to do that. We'll do it. You'll, you'll enjoy it. It'll be bloody. But the question then is, what next? And I think that's the big question that he asks and, and therefore challenges you to decide whether or not that was a good idea. It's interesting to note that at King Edward's school just out there when Shakespeare was a schoolboy, one of the texts that, one of the things he had to do in his, in his Latin class was to uh, write a speech, um, as far as we know from Lily's Latin grammar that he, that he studied, to write a speech by Brutus saying why it was right to assassinate Caesar. So even as a schoolboy, he's putting himself into the mindset of going, how would I defend that action? And I think that's an extraordinary thing to have done and kind of informs his whole uh, manner, his whole trade as a playwright, I think. So we've got a question coming in um, from our online audience and um, a question for the panelists, but it'd be great to get some thoughts both from uh, uh, you all here in the Stratford, the other place theatre, but also online. Who is the 21st century equivalent of Julius Caesar? <laughs> Uh, so please get tweeting uh, and tell us who you think your 21st century equivalent of Julius Caesar is. Uh, if there's any thoughts in the audience, then please get ready to speak. But for our panellists, is anybody ready to immediately go, well... Well, uh, having just come back from America, I know there are quite <laughs> a lot of people who are hoping that a certain assassination may happen fairly soon. <laughs> <laughs> We say no more. <laughs> Looking forward to that visa application next time. <laughs> uh, so Trump is um, Trump is up there as the as the 
potential big Julius Caesar. But he's but a good things. answer. I think. I mean, he is. Yeah. A, he's a really good answer. Not least because um, Caesar is presented by himself and to us by Shakespeare um, as as a man of the ordinary men, of the yeah. ordinary soldiers particularly. Um, but I guess we would now, armies are much smaller, ordinary working men is exactly who yeah. Trump consistently said he was appealing to and it uh, turned out rightly um, for all that snooty people uh, like us decided that, you know, that wasn't the case and it was just, you know, the few people at the rallies, a few hundred or thousand people at rallies and that wouldn't translate at the ballot box. It, it turned out that he did have the support actually of popular people, um, of ordinary, you know, people People rather than the elites, the fancy elites, um, as we were consistently told. And Caesar was, um, you know, if, uh, opposed by, by the elite, by the Senate, by the uh, optimates, if you want to use the um, Shakespearean phrase. Um, and, uh, and so I guess it seems like quite a, a legitimate description for me. I, I too hope that, um, well, I kind of thought the Ides of March could be a, a good time for us, but <laughs> not so far. So yeah, maybe we'll look forward to the Ides of of May and see how those go. <laughs> um, but any thoughts uh, online about who, who the 21st century Julius Caesar is? We'd love to hear from you. Um, and another online question. Do uh, we think that the politics, um, politics has changed from Shakespeare's days to now? And how? Lisa, I wonder if you have some uh, initial thoughts about changes from the politics that Shakespeare was writing in and the context that we're in now? Well, I, I hope politics has changed, um, <laughs> not only because it's a good 400 years between us, but also because obviously we're now living in a, in a more participatory uh, political system, even though still quite a few people feel they can't really, they're, they're not really part of it and they don't have a voice and they don't know how to, how to get involved in politics. But compared to the work Shakespeare was actually writing in, um, I think we have progressed quite some some way. I mean, I see girls in the audience. We do have a voice now. They didn't really have an awful lot of uh, an awful lot to say during Shakespeare's time. Um, we can do a live broadcast where we exchange our opinions on, on politics in a police state, in, in a state where every art form was censored. Um, that wouldn't have been possible either. So um, yeah, I think we, we have really moved on and we have the possibility and the opportunities now to make our voices heard. Um, as citizens, we are much more part of, of politics and what happens up there. It's not as completely disconnected as, as it was in Shakespeare's time when politics was much more power politics of the rich and the powerful. There wasn't an awful lot of possibility for people to lobby um, their, their own um, agendas, etc. So I do think we have moved on. <laughs> Ronan um, from Stratford School, could you come up please and tell us your question? Thank you. Um, at the age of 16 you can get married, you can have a child, and at 17 you can even drive but we're still denied a vote on some topics that may shape our future, such as Brexit. Do you think this is fair? Do you think, well, I'm gonna ask you first, Rhoda, what do you think? Well, you can, you can say, yeah, do you think it's fair? No. <laughs> okay, you think that? I think more needs to put, be put in to educate students on politics before they, they, can, they can have the vote. But on things like the EU, I mean, I know a lot, a good proportion of people who voted out have now died. <laughs> who, um, who voted leave. So I think votes like that we should have a say in. And of course in the Scottish referendum, 16-year-old it, it, and upwards could vote in the Scottish referendum. Yes. Um, but we didn't, we didn't choose to do that for the referendum last year. So um, I wonder if our panellists have any view on that. Thank you, Ronan. Um, I'd love to know if a show of hands... Would... Yes, great. Um, so in a question time fashion, Put your hands up if you think that at age 16 uh, you should be able to vote. An overwhelming majority. <laughs> Is there anybody who doesn't think you should be able to vote? And would you tell us why you don't think? You can just do it from your seats. Are there any counter-arguments um, 
to that. You're well placed next to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's off you go. What's the counter lesson. argument to it? <laughs> Very good point. point. Panellists, any views that you want to put into that? We're, we're a, while, a while away from our 16th birthday, but... Um, we're <laughs> I've Natalie. only got the dimmest recollection of what it was like when my knees didn't hurt, so, yeah, <laughs> I, can, I can only... But, of course, I agree with your uh, position uh, asking the question. Of course, I think you should have the vote. Um, I do see that not every 16-year-old uh, that... Uh, would have the capacity to vote would be as well informed as uh, you guys are today having spent the, the day with you um, but I have terrible news for you which is that some people who are quite old are also really uninformed yes. Yes. and you know didn't pay any attention and haven't been listening and don't care and won't turn up I don't my impression is not that um, people aged between 16 and 18 or indeed aged between 16 and uh, you know 30 uh, are somehow less well informed or less likely to turn out I find it exhausting that you get told that you're apathetic because you don't vote in large enough numbers um, when actually the options that you are given are so often terrible it's like you know you get to choose between being drowned in salt water or fresh water which one do you want hmm? <coughs> why aren't you voting that seems to it, often the question that we are asking you i paraphrase only slightly um of course i think you should have had a vote in the referendum last year uh, partly because then the referendum would have gone the way that i would want it to and that is <laughs> very hard to overlook um, but also because you will live with the consequences for longer than many of the people who voted um you'll certainly live with the consequences for longer than me we've already established that i intend to die gloriously in a car accident with the final words of Nero. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I'm, I'm, I, I've got to be honest, having spent the day with you, I'm feeling quite positive about the bit where you rise up and overthrow us. I feel like you'll be, <laughs> I feel like you'll be quite benevolent um, to, you know, classicists lurking in a corner with a, you know, dictionary and a pen. Um, so, yeah, obviously, I may be wrong. When you stab me with a pen, I'll regret it. But at the moment, I feel quite good about it. I feel the future is in safe hands. So, uh, yes, rise up, have fun, and I'm right, right with you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're the easy ones to overthrow. Uh, please let us know your views online. If you think that the voting age should be lowered to uh, 16, then we'd love to know that. Um, so I wonder if we could hear next from, uh, I think it's Akasha. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. From Stratford College, your question, please. Um, does Shakespeare's ancient Rome reflect the current state of politics better than the historically correct ancient Rome because of Shakespeare's heightened dramatics? Mm. Ooh, um, that's a tough one. Greg, what do you think? Do you think Shakespeare's ancient Rome does, first of all, reflect the current state of affairs in politics? Um, uh, in terms of it being uh, a, a place of turmoil and dissent, um, I think it absolutely does reflect that. Um, uh, in a way, the interesting thing about what Shakespeare is doing is, uh, and which you know, we've been talking about today, is he is just interpreting the ancient world, you know, why he's not interested in accuracy is effectively he's, he's debating his own world in the context of this story of the ancient world. Um, and what I find very interesting is, is, is how, how that, you know, there's a moment in Julius Caesar, isn't there, where Cassius at the assassination says, how many times shall this our scene be acted or in, um, in states unborn and accents yet unknown? Uh, and that virtually gets a round of applause in the theatre because, you know, we're still doing it. We're still finding those plays resonant and relevant. And, be, and if we wouldn't be, if they weren't actually engaging our attention now and making us think about ourselves through the metaphor of the ancient world. You don't, you know, many times we update Shakespeare, we put him in our, our own contemporary uh, costume. The last Julius Caesar we did, I directed, and I set it in modern Africa with a, uh, a, an entirely black cast. Uh, and that play, that, in that context, other things came through. In a modern context, you can suddenly, sometimes it feels as though uh, assassinating Julius Caesar is just like bumping off a particularly truculent chairman of the board and has no sort of mythic universality, if you like, no greater resonance than, than that. Um, in the African setting, it seemed to do that. But we will continue to interpret them because we want to engage with the politics of our day, I think. 
And Natalie, do you think that um, ancient Rome doesn't have as much resonance to the turbulence of our times today as the Rome that Shakespeare was presenting? Oh, I think it really does. I just don't think we have such easy access to it. I and mean, the thing is that Shakespeare is, um, he's like a gateway drug to, <laughs> if you want to try and persuade people that ancient Rome <laughs> is a, a good place That's a new marketing to go. strategy. Yes. <laughs> I'm just saying, um, he, yeah, he's the way in for lots and lots of people. Lots of people yeah. don't get to do Latin at school. I wish they did, yeah. but I do understand that not everyone gets to. Um, they don't get class civ always, classical civilization, I should say. Mm -hmm. I wish everyone had the chance to, but they don't always get to. So Shakespeare is a route into the ancient world for lots and lots of people. Um, and I think when you uh, have, followed, have followed his steps and taken yourself back to that first century BCE, the, the kind of constant foment is <laughs> so extraordinary. Um, I, I think it's, it's a very easy um, place to find yourself distracted by. It's a very easy place to spend a lot of time. And it is, uh, you know, exactly the same way with his uh, Greek plays where you find yourself going, oh, perhaps I would like to know a bit more about fifth century Athens. Oh, maybe I would like to know a bit more about the Trojan War. Yeah. Oh, maybe I would, you know, he is the way in. Isaac from Stratford College. Could Isaac come up? Great. Your question. Um, do the politicians now care more about the people than the politicians then? Ooh. Hmm. Tough question. Um, and Isaac, do you think they do? Um, I mean, I can't say much about then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really? Um, Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think they care now as much as they should. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got two thens represented. We've got Shakespeare's <laughs> then and we've got ancient Rome's then. So, Shakespeare's then, do we feel politicians then did, did care? I, I, I suspect that um, politicians care particularly around election times. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, they, uh, Tony Blair, Quoting somebody else, I suspect said, "You know, we um, uh, we campaign in poetry and we govern in prose, uh, and the idea that we need, mm. you know, like, like in that Titus Andronicus moment this, in the first this session this morning, uh, Bassianus is trying to persuade you of his point of view. Who knows? Once Bassianus, if Bassianus were to be elected, whether he would then care about the, the people and whether his rhetoric was indeed mere rhetoric just to get you onto his side. Uh, so I think that is probably common between ancient Rome or indeed Elizabethan uh, London or, or indeed today. Thank you. Lisa, Natalie, very briefly, are there any things that you would add to that? Yeah, I mean, in Elizabethan England, obviously politicians didn't have to care about the people. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> they weren't elected. Yeah. So, you know, you don't care. You don't have to. And the then of ancient Rome, Natalie? Yeah, I think people cared about appearance a lot more than um, fact, I suppose. Uh, they didn't care how happy you were with your representation because they weren't really there to represent you. They were there to represent themselves. And as a small, you know, flag for... Uh, not being entirely cynical about the current process. I think a lot of the problem with the disconnect between our politicians and us is because they are trying to do two opposing jobs, i.e. represent us, you're my MP, you're supposed to represent my interests, but also you're supposed to be part of a political party and follow a whip and therefore, you know, say and do what you're told from a, a wholly different source whose views may be completely opposing mine. So then you'll get asked on the record by a journalist with a microphone, do you think X or Y, a binary question, which means that you have to upset one or the other group of people. And that is why you end up with people hedging their answers. Of course, it is a bigger problem because what happens then is that you alienate everyone. Um, so it would be nice if we could get past, uh, which is better cats or dogs type of political <laughs> discourse, because it doesn't help anybody. Cats and dogs are both fine. The end is, should be the answer. And then everyone should talk more, you know, plausibly and convincingly, but while we operate in a political discourse which is so binary, um, I feel like we are destined to get um, vacuous answers. Thank you. So we have come to the end of our uh, online discussion. Uh, we had a final question which was going to be, how much is politics our responsibility? I think that's really something we're going to 
go on together and, and explore for the rest of the afternoon. Um, and we'd love to hear the views of those people that are joining us in the online space um, on Twitter of how much you think politics is our responsibility. Uh, but we look forward to reading your views. Thank you so much for all of your questions and please join me. Can I say thank just you. one thing, Jackie? Please which do, is, Greg. I'm really sorry that we didn't get the question, is this the same Caesar as the salad? <laughs> <laughs> really sorry we couldn't get it to isn't. answer that one. <laughs> and join me in thanking our panellists. <laughs> Great.